So we are going to dig into the material. So we just want to go over some uh, disclaimers, some housekeeping. We recognize that um, a lot of the research and literature is limited. It does not encompass all types of people and family systems. And so we just want to recognize that. Um, we also know that language is always changing. So we will be interplaying different language around mothers, fathers, partners, birth givers. Um, and we also just want you to take care of yourself throughout this part of the training. For many of the people in the room, you may have your have had your own experiences with perinatal mood and anxiety disorders or someone close to you. You may have known someone. So just really stand up, take a break, talk to the counselor at the, end of, at the back of the room if you need to. And um, this is just an opportunity for you to just really be mindful of how you're feeling while attending this training. So learning objectives, what we're going to be doing today is building on your awareness of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Ta we're going to be talking about prevalence and the impacts of untreated perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And then we're going to talk about some action steps. What can we do to screen and what are some of the evidence-based treatment modalities? And just to clarify that we're gonna go through this in two parts. So you'll see on the agenda that we have about probably an hour until lunch, and then we'll take a break and we'll come back and really focus on that third part, um, which will be the screening best practices and that um, if you have comments or questions that come up, um, feel free to jot them down if we have time or certainly over the break, we'd love to be able to address you know, as many of those as possible. But we want this to be interactive as much as you all are wanting. You know, we want this to feel kind of like a discussion too. So, um, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. You know, one of the things that we also just want to clarify: for so long, um, the terminology has been postpartum depression, or people have the postpartum, and so it's really important that we get the language right because we recognize that um, this is an umbrella term terminology and even though um, you know the postpartum period could be six weeks postpartum but we're really looking clinically um, at the the post uh, two years postpartum um, after birth okay So it's really important to understand what we mean by perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Today, we're not gonna go through in depth all of these disorders, but just to give you an idea of this spectrum, um, we have, um, we're gonna be talking about postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety. We're gonna speak a little bit about postpartum OCD and psychosis. Um, and a little bit about postpartum um, post-traumatic stress disorder and bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. So we already talked about this, um, but remembering that perinatal mood and anxiety disorders is the number one complication of childbirth, which is so valuable to keep that in mind because again, we recognize that gestational diabetes, which is you know six to eight percent of um, women, will be experiencing that, and we're screening for that. And obviously, we recognize the implications of having um, gestational diabetes, but there are definitely impacts to perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, not only to the birth giver, but to the whole family system. So we really want to be looking at um, 
how this is impacting everyone and that this is something that we can prevent and treat early. So we recognize that all of our literature as well is often conservative because it's mm -hmm. self-reported. So right now, you know, the numbers say one in five women experience um, mental health conditions during pregnancy and postpartum. As I said, it's often underreported because first of all, we're not necessarily screening everyone, as well as we recognize there's so much stigma associated to say, yes, I am suffering, or I'm having challenges during this period. Um, so only 30% of people who screen positive for anxiety or depression receive treatment. So again, what are the barriers? You know, what are the cultural barriers? What are the logistical barriers? Here in Georgia, we know that there are a lot of barriers for why people aren't receiving the treatment that they deserve. And just want to add to that part of why we're all here today, knowing that a good majority of you all are medical students or medical providers or in somewhere along that continuum of medical care, that you all have an opportunity um, regardless of whatever role you play, regardless of whatever population or agency or type that you serve, you're going to be seeing women or families that are having babies that are in the reproductive years. And if we go through all this material, it's so easy to get caught up in the problem and it feels insurmountable sometimes. But remembering and asking yourself, what's my role here? What can I do? 30% who screen positive receive appropriate treatment, that's, that's really low. We have a lot of opportunity for growth and you all here have an opportunity to play a bigger role in getting those numbers up. You know, asking the questions, knowing what to look for and knowing what the resources are. We hear so many times when we talk to, you know, doctors, even OBGYNs that will say, well, you know, where am I going to send them? Where, what am I going to do? you know, where do I go? And the good news is that, you know, we obviously have lots of room for growth there in terms of, you know, treatments, but there are a great number of untapped resources that are out there, free hotlines, free support groups, um, providers that are providing low cost or no cost services. So our hope for today is to at least have you take away at least one resource that you weren't aware of before and understanding of questions to ask and things like that. And, and just to piggyback on that, this is really an opportunity for interdisciplinary um, partnerships because we see that pregnant people and postpartum people are in so many different sectors. Mm -hmm. And so this is an opportunity for us all to be kind of sharing the same background of knowledge and connecting with each other so mm -hmm. that we can um, start to see these numbers decrease. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's really important is providing this kind of level of psychoeducation. We know that sometimes people get confused. What is normal? What are the baby blues versus what is postpartum depression? So baby blues can impact 60 to 80 percent of women, so this is a very normal condition. And it really occurs about, from birth to about two, maybe two and a half weeks postpartum. And what this can look like is, obviously they're having a significant hormonal shift. And so we often will see um, tears, mood changes, um, but, we recognize that it will resolve itself with some rest and care over time. This is, we don't need a medical intervention for this period. Um, it, it's really to be expected. What we're looking at is beyond the two weeks postpartum, what are they experiencing and are they still suffering? Additionally, what level of severity? So even sometimes it can be confusing because we do see the onset of um, perinatal anxiety or depression 
at an acute significant level. So that can be different than the baby blues. And just thinking about standard care right now with that postpartum follow-up visit, you know, most of the time, I'm not sure exactly what the protocol is, but if I'm guessing it's still about that six week postpartum. So just thinking about that, you know, when you're meeting with these families, with these parents, six weeks postpartum, if they're coming in tearful, really struggling, we already know it's not baby blues just because of the timing alone. Right. That doesn't mean, you know, but again, and what we'll go through later on the presentation, is that there's a variety of different levels of treatment. So just because they may still be struggling, we don't have to think, oh, I've got to refer them one way or the other to anything specific. It's about kind of knowing those different levels and options. But again, just thinking about that time frame of when you're going to be seeing these moms, if you're doing a home visit, if they're coming into your office four to six weeks postpartum and they're struggling, they're going to need some intervention. That's right. Right? Because um, the thing that we tell all the time is, postpartum mood and anxiety disorders are treatable. That's a really important thing. There's so very few things in life where we can provide that kind of clarity, but the key thing is it requires treatment. That's right. It's not just gonna go away magically on its own. If you meet the criteria of a mental health disorder, you know, most always, it's gonna need some kind of treatment. So again, as we stated, if this is happening beyond the two weeks, we want to start asking her more questions and start to be thinking about what kind of screening are we doing? Are we even asking her, are you having more bad days than good? Is like the simplest question we can ask someone. And that will tell us, do we need more information? So let's get into perinatal depression. So very similar to, uh, it's the same criteria for um, major depression. So we have excessive sadness, crying, feeling overwhelmed. Often what surprises a lot of people is the anger. And so lots of people think, when they think of depression, they think of those really um, those commercials for medication, cartoon commercials of someone who's depressed, and they think, I don't look like that. I'm still getting out of bed. I'm still taking care of myself or baby. I'm still, or other children, but I am very, very angry. In fact, I'm rageful. And so they're like, what's wrong with me? What do I have? Something, this is not me. However, it doesn't feel like depression because depression often can feel like that wet blanket feeling on us. Um, but they're still motivated to, to get out of bed to take care of themselves and or baby. It's, and so the anger piece is really important to listen to. And often when we're talking to partners, they will report to us, oh my gosh, this level of rage, I've never seen this before. Or you see that um, relationship discord. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at the body. You know, are they eating? Are they sleeping? Um, are they isolating when offered support? Um, and how are they attaching and bonding to baby? Even though we know that the um, stigma around attachment and bonding is often really, really high, so we want to you know, tell people attachment and bonding happens over time, but even with lots of support, if they're not able to do that, that is something for us to look into with them. So this is what you might see or hear when you are meeting with someone. They might um, be saying, she doesn't look like me, the baby. I can't, um, I can't make him stop crying. She doesn't respect me. I haven't baby proof my house. I'm having feeding issues. You see that maybe they don't want to do their follow-ups and they're really having a hard time 
taking care of themselves, even when they're having that level of support. So, but again, the, the piece that I hear and, and I, mm-hmm. is the anger piece, is, is the most pervasive um, thing that you will hear and it really is disarming for people because they think, why am I so angry? I work so hard to be able to have a baby and to be in this place and then I'm not even happy about it. What, what's going on here? Right, and because of the stigma piece, um, you know, they're not gonna come in and say I'm depressed, but they may also, also have a hard time coming in saying that I, I'm angry, I'm irritable, I rage, I yelled. There's a lot of great shame and covering of that. So again, the opportunity to really create this space of I know sometimes when we're feeling really bad during this time, we might have feelings, we may not be acting like ourselves, maybe we lose our temper. And just kind of creating and normalizing that space where they start to go, oh, okay, maybe they get it, I can talk about it. Because that's a really difficult thing for people to admit. I mean, you know, for Elizabeth and I, by the time they come into our offices, they've already achieved some level of awareness and understanding that they need support. Not everybody has a therapist. Right? So the fact that they're coming to a therapist, they already are at lo- some increased level from baseline of being able to talk about that. But especially in a different type of provider situation, they might need a little more coaxing when you notice those signs. Something's off. And, and another piece with that is um, there's often so much attention on baby and having that healthy baby and that excitement. So there can feel like there's not a lot of room to talk about her feelings Mm -hmm. or her partner's feelings. So it's really um, valuable to not only asking about baby, but how are you doing? Oh, it's on the next slide, sorry. Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to shift now into perinatal anxiety. And, you know, again, I just want to really hone in this fact that it's not necessarily going to feel so distinct. There's a lot, as you'll see, of overlap between depressive and anxiety symptoms. And especially during, during the high functioning clients, the ones that really are able to manage a high level of distress, a high level of dysregulation. Um, It may be confusing to know, is this depression? Is this anxiety? Is a little bit of both? From our perspective, it doesn't really matter in terms of getting them referred to treatment. You know, we'll get to that nuance of care. Um, But we do want to spend a couple of minutes just talking about something specific when we talk about perinatal anxiety. And As a reminder, perinatal encompasses both the pregnancy as well as this postpartum time frame, right? You can absolutely see these symptoms in pregnancy as well. So there's the things you can see and there's the things you can't see when we talk about anxiety. The things you can't see are going to be the constant log of worry, the thoughts, just that hypervigilance around noticing everything with regards to the baby, with regards to bringing the baby home, feelings they're having in their body, just a lot of excessive and over-focus on those things. And again, if we don't ask the questions, we're not gonna know because they're all in their head. Um, Things that you might see would be more on this side, you know, perhaps if they're having a lot of weight loss or weight gain, something to notice. What's going on here? Um, are you able to eat, eat in a way that feels consistent with what you're supposed to be doing at this point? Are you eating healthy, nutritious foods? Is there nausea? Is there any discomfort? Is there not enough time or focus on being able to do those types of things? Now, I kind of laugh at the sleep disruption or sleep disturbance because you know we generally accept that most postpartum families are gonna be having some kind of sleep disruption. So it's not about are you sleeping? Are you getting enough sleep? Because the answer is almost always gonna be no, but it's are you able to sleep when you have the opportunity to sleep? If your baby is settled and you maybe have a partner or you have an opportunity to go take a nap or get a decent amount of sleep and you can't turn your mind off, then that's that's a red flag, right? And then that, that physical, what I call like the nervous system stuff, that physical agitation, the restlessness, you know, just hands moving, a lot of fidgeting, a lot of discomfort in the body, 
um, these are things that are going to be signs that there's probably some anxiety going on. And just like with depression, they're not going to come in and necessarily say, I have anxiety. They might say, I'm anxious or I'm worried. But, you know, we're going to be looking for hypervigilance, hyperfocus, things like feeding. Is my baby eating enough? This is really difficult because inherently to this time frame, especially from a medical perspective, we're probably putting a lot of emphasis on these types of things. You know, your baby's underweight, especially if you have a baby in the NICU, if you have a baby with feeding to thrive. You know, I am sure you see, but a lot of my clients that deal with high anxiety are, because, are really directly tracked back to a moment in their early motherhood journey where they were told, your baby has to be feeding more. You have to be focusing on the amount of calories, the amount of nutrition, the amount of feeding times, and they get stuck in this loop and that hypervigilance paralyzes them, right? Yeah, and I just want to couple on that. So to always be listening to the physiological symptoms your clients are telling you, because we often, they aren't even connecting those dots that they're necessarily having this level of mental health distress. They're saying, I have a stomach ache and I can't eat, or I'm too nervous to eat. Additionally, um, when this is their first baby, they have nothing to compare it to. So they think, is this normal? And it's almost like you don't want to say it out loud um, to compare it to other people because they feel bad about it. So they're not talking about it out loud. But often, I mean, Melissa and I talk quite a bit that we see more perinatal anxiety than depression. As what you know, as Melissa said, they often vacillate between the two, but anxiety is the piece that is very prevalent. Like I want to say, like ninety percent of the clients I see are more on the anxiety side for sure, with some depressive components. Um, so it's just a little quick video that we wanted to share, just to kind of highlight, like we talked about that sort of thought process that's sort of going on. You know, watching. So again, just to sort of give another visual component to, you know, all you really would see was this woman with her baby in the cute stroller walking around and this chitter chatter that's going on, we need to ask. We have to look, we have to ask. And I love this little graphic. If you're not familiar with um, Karen Kleinman's work, she's, you know, really well known in this world of perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. She has a clinic up in Pennsylvania and she's done a lot of um, education and work around this and she's got this book which we'll reference later on called um, Good Moms Have Scary Thoughts and I just love all of these little graphic illustrations give us little just like you know just to give you a sense of all that stuff that's going on in their head. As we talked about, you know, there's lots of different themes that can present some which seem obvious some which don't necessarily make sense to us. 
Um, but, you know, obviously we talk about things that are kind of hard when you think about it. And imagine that you're a new mom or you're a new parent and you have these images of bad things happening to your child. Maybe even you doing bad things to your child, harming yourself. Um, really just this constant worry of, am I good enough? Am I doing the right thing? There's more I should be doing and just kind of being caught in that, that thought loop. So one topic that we think is really important to talk about is this distinction of anxiety, OCD, and also psychosis. Um, in the context of the time we have, we can only really kind of cover the skim atop, um, but wanted to just really kind of spend a little bit of time talking about some of these distinctions and, and how it might present and things to look for. Um, but just the staggering amount of significant increase in OCD during this time frame. There's such a vulnerable time, you know, for our reproductive families already, thinking about hormonal changes, sleep disruption, physical changes in the brain, changes to just support, um, you know, all of those things that we know that there's an increased risk uh, hands down during this time. And it's not uncommon, I know, from just the clients that I see to come in and for the first time kind of put this designation on, oh, okay, I think I am <laughs> experiencing a little bit of OCD or OCD-like behaviors. Um, and just to nod our good old COVID, um, you know, it is significant. You know, things that were already heightened are now just over the top. I mean, I think now the actual diagnostic, it's like one in three for just in general for perinatal mood anxiety disorders. But I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of staggering, unfortunately, right now, given all of the life stressors that are going on. Are you all familiar with some of the recent media coverage of the family up in Massachusetts? Just kind of by show of nods or heads or hands, yeah. And um, I bring that up just because we know that this is something that, you know, is part of that barrier and that stigma. What happens is that there's a lot of sensational, you know, media coverage um, when we have um, an episode that involves psychosis, um, infanticide or suicidality around that. Um, and obviously that's really, you know, um, severe and traumatic and we want to put a lot of attention to that. Um, but it's, unfortunately, it's sensationalizing the amount of women that are actually experiencing psychosis. Um, versus the amount of women that are more likely experiencing OCD. And if you look at just this little kind of basic Venn diagram, um, the only real overlap between these two is the fact that they both incorporate strange, bizarre, intrusive thoughts. And remember, intrusive thoughts, scary thoughts, you know, thoughts that are automatic that you're not intending to have is what's going to be that common denominator between OCD and psychosis. The main distinction really is in the person's awareness and how consistent it is with their, you know, their sort of where they're at in their understanding, right? So for someone who's experiencing OCD and has an intrusive thought, this is not going to be consistent with their viewpoint and they're most likely going to be absolutely terrified. I can't believe I had that thought. Where did that come from? I was walking up the stairs with my baby in my hands and I had this image of them falling down the stairs, maybe even throwing them down the stairs. Where did that come from? I would never do that. And as a result, they're most likely then gonna do two things. Um, one, either to hold on for dear life and increase that hypervigilance around I'm going to make sure that when I'm going up the stairs, I have all my faculties, I am 100% engaged and I am focused, or avoidance. I'm going to make excuses, you know, have somebody else hold the baby, I'm a little tired, um, you know, I'm going to bathe them downstairs, you know, and that's just one example. Someone with psychosis may have a similar thought, and in the context of in that psychosis, it will maybe seem consistent. So for example, if this is involving, oh, this Ooh, is I not working. Better. Oh, okay. It's a little, it's a little low in the back. Oh, okay. okay. We're staying close to Can you hear me in the back? Sorry about that. Um, I apologize. If, um, if someone is in a psychotic episode 
and perhaps they're thinking that their baby is possessed or their baby is dangerous and the idea of their baby you know dying that would be consistent with that psychotic feeling and therefore to them in their delusioned delusional state it makes sense right but someone who's experiencing anxiety or OCD is going to immediately know that this is ter terrifying and I absolutely will never do that. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and just a couple like nuanced pieces with the, the OCD piece is um, Melissa described kind of some of the behaviors of avoidance or hypervigilance but often there's internalized, um, they feel like they're losing their mind. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of shame associated with that and or, and or guilt. And so the piece that is really valuable is that we can ask our mothers and our birth givers and family members, are you having thoughts that are popping into your head that make you feel nervous or scared or you wonder where they're coming from and if and for so often people will be like oh, yeah that's never happened to me before or you know it hasn't happened to me in a long time mm -hmm. and so it's really important that we normalize that but again there's a clear distinction because with postpartum psychosis this occurs one to two per thousand mothers. So this is not common, however, it is a medical emergency and requires immediate treatment. Um, but it is really important because often what happens, we've seen you know, in the media is that someone will be having an intrusive thought, they feel like they're losing their mind, they go to get help but their medical providers don't understand that they're having postpartum OCD symptoms or this disorder. And they hear it as postpartum psychosis. And so then next thing you know, they are whooshing the baby away from them and they are giving them the, it, the wrong treatment. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we understand these nuances. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and familiarizing yourself with whatever the protocol is in the facility that you work within, whatever provider type you happen to be working within, whatever organization, asking those kinds of questions. What is our protocol for this? You know, what are the follow-up questions? Um, and as Elizabeth said, we just asking. You know, I can't even tell you the number of times I've been working with a client for several sessions and they're focusing on something else and I start to get a little bit of a curiosity that there's something else going on and I'll just kind of say, hey, you know, have you ever had any thoughts just kind of pumping in your, popping in your head about that? And they'll kind of look at me and go, yeah. And then just, I usually have, you know, ref that um, book that I referenced before, I have when I do my telehealth, I have it behind my head on, intentionally. Um, and I'll usually reference to that because that helps to normalize it. That helps to let them know, I get it. I understand what you're talking about. This is scary, but there's something we can do. The next couple of slides, I'm not gonna go in too in depth because it's pretty clinical, um, but just wanting to note, because again, this is a question that we get a lot when we're working with providers in developing a protocol around screening for OCD versus psychosis is what is our plan? What do we need to be you know, what's that order of events to be able to feel more confident and comfortable that we have a good treatment plan? So just quickly to run through this, remember, you know, asking the question to determine if these clients are experiencing intrusive thoughts or not, right? Understanding the frequency and then also important, the severity and disruption to them. For someone who doesn't have anxiety, they can have an intrusive thought and quickly dispel. This is this is out nowhere. I'm not going to do anything with that. That's terrible. But then it just kind of, like we say, just kind of rolls right through their head. No disruption. So we really want to get down into that is what kind of distress are they having from these intrusive thoughts? Are they changing behavior? Are they restricting things that they do? Are they, you know, doing any kind of rituals or 
you know, compulsive activities in their head that we wouldn't see. Of course, we think about the classic visual OCD symptoms like checking things multiple times, washing their hands, but a lot of times it's the stuff you can't see, the kind of pure O or the sort of um, o covert compulsions. And so those are the things that we're really gonna have to ask for. You know, do you have to do any counting in your head? Um, are you avoiding certain things, saying any kind of phrases over and over in your head? And really giving a lot of psychoeducation around these. Um, I, I do think it, and we're gonna be talking about this after lunch, mm -hmm. um, but to understand the nature or the, the role of suicidal ideation and if present follow suicide protocol, so that is something we're gonna be talking about this afternoon, but making sure where, wherever you're working to that you have a, a suicide protocol and, you, and you're really familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you want to ask a question? Of Please. Course. Now, I, I just had a question. About what are some of the most interesting covert uh, like OCD type thought patterns Jennifer was just asking about some examples of some interesting covert or sort of kind of in your head um, compulsive things. Ooh. Um, I, I don't know if it's most interesting, but one that I've seen more often um, is a lot of counting. A lot of counting in the head, a lot of sort of pattern. I have um, actually a current client that revealed, again, with some kind of investigative reporting that she plays games, like um, solitaire games, and depending on how the numbers roll up in the solitaire game, that helps her feel um, like, kind of from a, pro like a, a superstitious perspective, like if, if it's like three show up, for example, she feels like everything's gonna be okay, but if like a black four comes up in that solitaire, that's kind of a random one that just came up, but I, you know, we were really talking about how she was using games to distract, and it wasn't until we started really getting underneath that that it had to do with the numbers that were associated with this game that was actually, Toby? Prayer is a yep. really common thing for people, especially, I was educated up north, and there were many, 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 many Catholics, so they had the rosary, mm -hmm. and so individuals will say the rosary so many times, the good number of times, but it has to be right. And if it's not right, they have to repeat and start all over again. So that can um, occupy quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. So for those who couldn't hear, Toby was just talking about prayer, saying the rosary, saying things in certain order, saying it until it feels right. And again, they might not be saying it out loud, it might be in their head and you wouldn't know it. Any examples you can think of, Elizabeth? Um, not necessarily to add to that, but just to also recognize that so many, unless we're asking, they're so often similar to that video that we just showed of her kind of going through all of those, am I feeding enough, am I doing this enough? Like all of these um, insecurities that are really running through her head that become obsessions. And so unless we're asking about it, because we can see like, when we're looking at someone's face, like, oh, maybe you're tired, maybe you're distressed. That makes sense. You're a new mom, you haven't slept that well, but we're not always asking these, these questions. Um, so it's very important that we create this space for that. Mm -hmm. And not, not necessarily covert, but there's a lot of fear often that we see around knives, scissors, stabbing. I've had several clients Again, they're not gonna tell me, but I had one that sort of just it's like haphazardly mentioned, you know, if I walk by the kitchen and there's a knife out on the counter, I'll just quietly go and just put it in the drawer. And it wasn't until I really started asking a lot of questions about that that we realized like she was really having a lot of obsessive thoughts around that and it was a very quiet compulsion. You know, she would just take the knife and put it in the drawer. I wanna put it away. Why? What's gonna happen if not? Mm -hmm. um, so things like that. And remembering, we're trying to make this distinction between treating it as obsess obsessive compulsive disorder or obsessive compulsive behavior, anxiety, or psychosis, 
And just like Elizabeth said a minute ago about having a really good protocol around suicide, suicidality, I would put that in the camp of just having a really good emergency protocol. When we're talking about psychosis, this is an emergency situation. It requires a different level of treatment. Um, it may involve later on things like therapies and group support, but it's a lot of times in terms of the order of treatment. Where's that first referral? And remembering that psychosis is a break with reality. A lot of times someone who's experiencing psychosis is not gonna be the one that comes to you for support. It's gonna be a family member, a husband, a partner, a sister, somebody who says, something's not right here. They're not acting like themselves and they're saying some pretty crazy things. Um, and they may be dragged in. They may be you know, um, the one calling the support hotline or coming to group. Um, and, and just a, another piece to just also recognize that when the vulnerabil vulnerability period um, of the perinatal period for women, that this is the, the highest rates and um, occurrences of when you'll see hospitalization for mental health. So it's just a very vulnerable time that we want to be watchful for our clients because again, they are, it's not just the, it's the client and baby and, and that because they really need this level of care. Mm -hmm. We'll get into risk factors in general in just a minute, but just to add a little note here on psychosis, you know, when we're thinking about who's most at risk at that, at the, for this, you know, of course, a person, like we talked about before, a personal or family history of psychosis, as well as a personal or family history of bipolar disorder. Um, these are not the only risk factors, and that's not to say that they're necessarily going to experience psychosis, but when you're working with a patient who maybe has that in their history, then, you know, you probably want to just pay a little bit extra attention that they may be at an increased risk here. So you want to keep an extra eye on them. And we typically will see psychosis four to six weeks postpartum. That is the most common time. However, you can have someone who is six months postpartum who has had maybe six days of sleep deprivation. Remembering sleep deprivation can create a psychotic episode, right? So we often are really watchful in those first you know, month or so, but we also want to be looking at that relationship with sleep and mental health in general. Mm -hmm. And remembering if you happen to suspect psychosis and they're alone, especially if they're alone with their baby, you know, that would be an indicator to, you know, stay with them until a partner is able to come and take the baby or have, again, going back to that protocol. It is very rare, again, I just want to really clarify this. Um, it is serious, and we want to take it seriously and have appropriate treatment, but, you know, just to just kind of quelch any of that kind of anxiety around that, as I know. Toby? I'm sorry. We just had a meeting for Lifeline for Moms, which is another organization, and what our discussion was, it's much more common mm -hmm. than you. And we, so with an organization that I'm part of, Lifeline for Moms, we just talked on Tuesday about postpartum psychosis. And the overwhelming feeling among all of us from across the country, providers, was it's becoming much more common for some reason. And when I was in training, we thought about it often occurring within the first week or two, mm -hmm. and now we are seeing people six months, nine months out presenting with a first-time psychosis mm -hmm. after they have delivered a baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the research continues to grow. Mm -hmm. And I think, unfortunately, on trend with what we're seeing in general for all mental health, the numbers are not getting better, you know? Unfortunately, so we can always keep doing better. 
Okay, and just a couple of resources that we wanted to share. I referenced the Good, Good Moms Have Scary Thoughts book. It's just a book you can get on Amazon. It's got some great caricatures and little ways just to kind of start the conversation. I recommend just have it in your office, have it around, recommend it to new parents. My only disclaimer on that is if you're working with someone who's experiencing intrusive thoughts already or they're more at risk at that, we probably don't want to add in too many new ideas. Um, so I, I just personally don't usually recommend this directly to a postpartum mom, but I think it's just helpful for us as providers to have as reference. The Pregnancy and Postpartum Anxiety Workbook is a wonderful workbook that you can use in companion to other therapies or working with someone directly. I reference it all the time. Um, and it's a great book. Two different scales, I think it was referenced earlier, the perinatal anxiety screening scale. I personally love this one as a diagnostic tool. It is a screening tool, so it's not gonna give you a, a diagnosis on its own, um, but I use this quite often with most of my clients, in addition to what you might get out of the EPDS, which we'll go over in a minute. This one gets into a lot more nuances when, when it comes to different versions of anxiety and different things. It helps us also as clinicians to know where to focus our attentions. Um, if we're talking more generalized anxiety or specific phobias, if we're talking about social anxieties, et cetera. And we wanna go over, um, just as a, an example, a case study that Elizabeth's gonna have us go through. She's gonna walk you through an example of an actual case of a client that she's worked with. And then we wanted to give you all an opportunity to think about questions and how you might approach this client, and then even give you an opportunity to um, share your thoughts in just a minute. Okay, so we have a 28-year-old white woman, uh, first-time mother, and she came in to, um, at eight months um, postpartum, and she had a baby boy. She was happily married for three or four years, she worked in healthcare part time. Her husband worked full time. She'd never been in therapy before. She was highly motivated, you know, what's the homework kind of situation. She had some local support and um, she had a family history of anxiety but was never diagnosed. So, the presenting in, um, issue. She had increased anxiety, distressing thoughts of harm to baby and family, hesitant to allow anyone to take care of baby besides family, ruminating on the, what if this happens? What if this happens? Specifically, she worried a lot about what if baby was sexually abused? She had intrusive thoughts of sexual abuse um, and those would occur when she was changing baby's diaper she was really embarrassed um, to talk about that. That didn't come out um, for a while. Um, and she thought that if she said that out loud, her husband would worry that, you know, why is she even thinking about sexually abusing baby? And is she losing her mind? Um, additionally, um, this client was a hunter with her um, husband and she was an avid hunter and never had issues with guns um, this was in another state um, and she even the, though the guns were it locked in a safe box in another room she would avoid certain parts of the house because she would be afraid that somehow the gun would come out of the locked container and explode and hurt baby. So we wanted to just um, bring this case to you and to kind of open up to see what are some of the considerations that you would have if this client came either if you were doing a home visit with this client and she started reporting these things to you, or if this client came into your particular office, what are some of the considerations that you might have um, when working with her? And so we can just kind of open it up to, we have another mic um, that we can ask people, or you can just raise your hand or stand up.
is there anything is there anything specific that you would want to know questions you might want to ask right here I guess one of the things that I would consider just learning more about is whether these thoughts or these compulsions are sort of egodystonic or how they have been distressing them or how this aligns with their values just to sort of tease out between OCD anxiety versus psychosis. I would like to know more about um, this patient's support system and how often that she's alone in her home or if there are other people that are around her during the daytime or nighttime. Mm -hmm. So what is her level of support? Um, how often is she by herself? Things like that. Good. Um, definitely would want to assess her own experiences of uh, abuse. Yes. Good. Knowing a little bit more about her trauma background and her experience. Mm -hmm. Or if she had a trauma background at all. Right. Right. Yes, so finding out does she have a history of childhood trauma? If so, what, what, let's begin to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Does she? So that's the interesting thing about intrusive thoughts. You absolutely could have be triggered because maybe she had a history of child sexual abuse or someone she knows. But the other piece with intrusive thoughts are, you know, they can pop in to your head from out of nowhere. So I maybe I had an intrusive thoughts of dropping baby or putting baby into an oven. I had no history or trauma history about putting anybody into an oven or anything like that. So that's the interesting piece. We kind of go to they must have. And often, you know, statistically, we know that one in four girls have had a history of child sexual abuse. So it is certainly some questions we want to ask history, but, but not assume. So what I would want to know is, since it's an increased anxiety, is there a trigger in fact that she reads something, that she sees something, hears something, where is that coming from? Was it just an intrusive thought, or did it come from another resource, and how can we go ahead and call those fears? Okay, excellent. Great questions, great insight. I want to know how debilitating these thoughts and anxieties are. Um, moms aren't just moms. They also have to take care of themselves. Some have jobs that they have to go to um, after a while, and if somebody else is not going to be able to care for the baby when she's away, that might be debilitating for her. Mm -hmm. um, as to the guns, like where are the guns? Do you often access that part of the home? Is that somewhere that you need to go? Um, if they're locked in a safe and they're not loaded and ammunition is somewhere else. That's just about as safe as you can get with a gun. So that might be debilitating for her also if she's not able to walk into those places of the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would want to ask too what coping strategies that she might already be engaging in before coming into therapy because sometimes people do have healthy things that they're already trying, but sometimes people also shift towards unhealthy coping strategies or even self-medicating with alcohol or drugs or something. Mm -hmm. and that I would want to be asking about that too. So what are the coping skills she's already using and try to help tease out what's healthy or what's not healthy? We've okay. we got I'm one more. For one more, and I think we've got just a few minutes to wrap up this part before our break. Um, I was going to ask, like, I know that Minnie talks about um, the, the fact that there's a gun in the home that, you know, she's trying to avoid kind of going in that area, but also just asking her, has she had any thoughts of, like, directly harming the baby? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are all really great points, right? Because it's going to be so nuanced and just getting you all to think about some of these 
factors that we can rule out. Of course, we always want to be considering safety. We want to be considering history and likelihood of acting on any of these thoughts. And our hope is also just to remember that sometimes these thoughts are just thoughts and they're coming from anxiety. And it's, it's their brain trying to warn them about something. It's been sort of, you know, gotten caught up in the wires. Um, and, and having this education and continuing to be able to hold space to ask those questions is really, really important that we don't jump to conclusions, that we don't increase that shame, right? And so the other piece that I think is really, really valuable to keep in mind is perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are biopsychosocial. So what, are we addressing the bio? Ha, my first question to her is, how much are you sleeping? Is your baby sleeping through the night? Have you had three hours of uninterrupted sleep last night, last week? Have you eaten? Are you dehydrated? Are you taking any medications? So again, really, you know, have we looked at your thyroid? you know, really evaluating the body first because we know the relationship with sleep deprivation and increased symptoms of depression and anxiety. So we have to rule out the medical, the body first. Because again, if we, I can give my clients a buffet of coping skills, but if they are chronically sleep deprived, they cannot stand up to go grab those coping skills at that table. So we have to start there. And we have time. Should we? I was just gonna ask one thing, and yeah, we should probably break for lunch. Um, just the, the idea of the intrusive thoughts, because you see that can kind of work both ways, because exposure therapy is a way that to desensitize and downregulate. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder, do you ever use exposure therapy? So Absolutely. I go into the, this one room and the guns are locked up, but I get really anxious. Mm -hmm. And that's popping into your head. Like when it's intrusive and it's spontaneous and you can't control it, it's deleterious. But then mm -hmm. on the flip side, you see exposure therapy used where you're you know, kind of building up tolerance to the trigger. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Do you use that at all with perinatal? We do use, um, but we're also sensitive of how we're bringing baby into that picture of exposure therapy, right? And what is their level of stability? Exposure therapy is a great um, treatment modality for OCD and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, there are things that we're not going to do, for an example, if there was a fear of, as Melissa mentioned before, knives. We're not going to be um, ex exposing baby to knives and things like that. Well, if I could just add though, with that particular client that I referenced before, now keeping in mind that by that point, she was on medication, we had been in active therapy, she was making a lot of progress. And when we talked about her intrusive thoughts around the knives on the on the counter in the kitchen and her inability to tolerate that because the thoughts were coming about something having the knives that was actually part of our plan we did exposure therapy around her being able to tolerate the knives staying on the counter and resisting her urge to put it away and actually for her i was it was a quite quick um, work through for her at that point again because she already had the baseline going. She had the medication, she was in therapy, she was getting regular sleep, and at that point she was able to very quickly do that. Um, another example and consideration, if it's okay, many of our intrusive thoughts revolve around the baby's sleeping and stopping um, breathing in the middle of the night. That's a very common one. Um, and of course with the fear of SIDS, with you know understandable fears around you know very vulnerable and dependent baby, um, Mostly what we see, and you know, we hear this all the time, is I have a thought that my baby stopped breathing in the middle of the night, so I wake up and I'm staring at them, and I am not sleeping. 
um, you know, and, and again, they can kind of justify it. Well, they, you know, it's recommended that the baby sleeps in my room in the bassinet, so the baby's right here, and I'm listening to their breathing. And yes, from a traditional mental health perspective, we would probably want to do some exposure therapy around not checking, not being considerate. But we also have to consider where they're at. If they're a brand new mom, and there's nothing we're going to say to them, oh, don't check on your baby. No. They're not gonna care. They're actually probably then gonna completely stop listening to any advice that we have at that time, right? So I think that's where it comes into consideration and to answer your question, um, Jennifer, yeah, I mean, I think that you know exposure and response prevention can work really great, but it's not the only tool that we have. And it is really nuanced when we're talking about this time frame sometimes. And just to also remember that there is um, some of the increased anxiety is part of our biology mm -hmm. and it is very normalized and so we we want to recognize it is there to keep our baby alive and so we don't want to we want to normalize their experience but we want to see that it begins to decrease over time and that it is not staying at that same level that's the important piece because it is, it is part of our biology. Okay, before we get into the next section, we did have uh, one other question, which is how often or how likely is it that PPD, OCD can transition into postpartum psychosis? Great question. And one that we see and hear all the time. The honest answer is never. It's not gonna turn into psychosis. Does that mean that someone can still have a risk factor of having psychosis if they're diagnosed with OCD? Yes, I mean, just like anyone. But it's not a continuation of not getting enough treatment. That's my understanding anyway. Yes, yes. So, right, you, someone could later um, in their postpartum period have postpartum psychosis, but it is not related or caused by postpartum OCD? There is increased morbidity, or the, the, the likelihood is increased. Uh, increased risk factor. Right. Yeah. If, if someone has postpartum depression, postpartum OCD, versus someone who doesn't, that individual with the disorders is more likely to be able to develop postpartum psychosis than the asymptomatic person. Mm -hmm. But would you say that it would turn into, I guess that's the clarification that we're making. Obsessions typically will not become delusions, but there is a psychotic form of OCD. So, right. right. Whoever asked the question, there's not a clear answer and just make sure whoever's got it is in good care. What starts out as a fixation Oh yeah. Cannabis, bags, 
excuse me, bad shit. Oh, they're gonna have to beat me. <laughs> Cannabis increases the likelihood of psychosis. So there are risk factors. So one thing can ultimately develop into something else, unfortunately. However, clinically, it has never been my experience that I have ever worked, I work with lots of clients who have had OCD or OCD symptoms that never moves into psychosis. So is, it, is there always room for possibilities? Yes. Are there greater risk factors to be considering their whole, um, ask, or their whole, their mental health? to be higher, higher risk factors. However, um, there is a big distinction with OCD clients and, and postpartum psychosis clients. One, okay, we've got it. <laughs> okay. I guess this is kind of for the four of you. Or stimulants. Yeah. Stimulants can be that too. Okay. And then my other question was, when somebody comes in and is on, like you, know, you said, a baseline, they're already being treated mm -hmm. um, pharmacologically. Mm -hmm. Are they better able to like uptake and in integrate the tools? The clinical tools yes. are getting. Okay. Yes. This is kind of something that I, I talk about with yes. my med students. Is if you're coming in, your baseline, your anxiety level is so high, you're not being medically that it's hard to pull back and implement mm -hmm. you know some strategy because the anxiety level is so high in the first place Generally, the conversation that we'll have with clients, um, you know, who kind of are more med resistant in general, they think I, I don't want to do medication, so I'm going to do therapy, but that's it. And we kind of have to meet them where they're at, right, as therapists. Um, and typically the conversation I have with them is, okay, I'll meet you there, unless of course there's some real significant symptoms that we need to address more seriously right away. Um, we'll set a plan and we'll say, okay, we're gonna go through some tools that are gonna help to manage distress, help you get sleeping, increase your, su your support, start to process your experience, and in you know, however many weeks, we're gonna reassess, and if you're not able to you know, do the things that we're talking about in between session. If you're having a hard time, you know, working at them in session, then that's going to be a good indicator that we need to add in something else. And sometimes that's how we walk them into more comfort level with with the medication. But absolutely, Jennifer, you know, once they are feeling more stable, then they're going to be, their brain is able to come online enough to be able to actually do the things they need to do. Right. Yes. I mean, the biggest symptom that um, is sleep deprivation, and then the history, family history of bipolar disorder. So sometimes people, women will have their first onset of bipolar disorder, you know, in, um, in the perinatal period. And, and I know one feature too, um, doctors please clarify if I'm incorrect, is someone who's going through psychosis they can function better on the lack of sleep. Is that your understanding, right? So that is a dis Yeah, so that can actually be a real distinct feature, right? If we're talking about chronic sleep deprivation and they are actually functioning pretty okay from that perspective, right? They're not like, Ugh, you know, um, what we would expect to see, that that's a good indicator as well that that's what's going on. That, 
That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. And, and well, and so thank you for for bringing that up because there is a lot of attention um, in the training because that also relates to stigma because they have nothing to compare it to. But that can turn things upside down um, as well when you've had one or two or three or several um, pregnancies and births and in and, and the postpartum where things have moved pretty smoothly and they've adjusted and then all of a sudden something feels dramatically different. Mm -hmm. And that can be um, really challenging and, and, and moms and parents don't necessarily even know what to do with that information. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad she brought that up because if a woman comes back, she's already had a child, so I think, okay, she's good, she's not going to experience it, but mm -hmm. every pregnancy is different. Every Absolutely. Pregnancy every pregnancy is different. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And yes. Well, right, because, and it, exactly, so talking about how every pregnancy is different, every postpartum is different, and in fact, there are even different risk factors that when you have other children to attend to, it's harder to take care of yourself um, because you're, um, you know, you can be burning the candle at both ends because you're taking care of other people. And also the temperament of the baby, the quality of your pregnancy, if you had birth trauma, if you had a high risk pregnancy, you know, any of those factors will be individual for each pregnancy. Right. A couple things? One more. I'm not going to leave you guys. Okay. <laughs> no, it's good. But do you, I guess really for the four of you, do you notice any seasonal effects? Hmm. Yeah. Like spikes in the winter? We see more, we see more mania, we see more psycho and probably related psychosis in the spring and summer, but I don't know if we could say that in general about postpartum psychosis. Mm -hmm. I, and I would say, so I used to work clinically up in Fairbanks, Alaska, so where there is seasonal affective disorder and there is that level of um, kind of almost bipolar weather and climate. Um, so I would say across the board, mental health, you see those fluctuations because of the geography. But I wouldn't say, um, I, I, have, I don't know any research that has talked season, about seasonal affective disorder um, in relation to, but there could be. Uh, and then I could just say anecdotally, clients are probably reporting and maybe more of the depressive symptoms you know for sure we're going to see more of that in the you know winter months just right. by way of just conversation and how we process things your question about postpartum psychosis and uh, bipolar in a subsequent pregnancy rather than the first um, think of bipolar as a spectrum in that just because you haven't been diagnosed yet doesn't mean it hasn't been there in the past. And so oftentimes when we're talking to somebody who's had an episode in a postpartum time frame, their family will say, oh, you know, they're so creative and spontaneous and fun. Or, you know, sometimes I am just really productive. I am like on fire, you know, I can get so much done. And so what, they're telling you is that they have some of the features of bipolar, but they're not impaired, and they may have never reached a clinical point. Or they may have uh, had some impairments, but been misdiagnosed as having an anxiety disorder because their thoughts are racing and they feel so restless and agitated. Or they can't sleep because they, the way that somebody similarly with anxiety might not be able to or ADHD, um, you know, that they're, you know, I just can't think clearly. You know, uh, and what is actually happening is, this is, uh, as Dr. Goldsmith calls it, bipolar waiting to happen. And so that's why it's important to get a good sense of, you know, what were you like before? What were things like with your previous pregnancies? You know, what, what was your, were there ever periods of time before now that you, you felt different uh, because it, 
to call them bipolar by DSM criteria ultimately means that they have to have an impairment because of the symptoms. But the symptoms can be there and not cause an impairment in the past. Mm -hmm. And that can be your clue that this has been the tipping point that's brought them into the place where they're impaired. Mm -hmm. Great, great clarification. Got a couple more. Couple and just more. to add, I mean, I think that could be true for pretty much any mental health disorder, right? Oh, you, got you know? My, my question is, I don't know if I'm going to ask this word or not, but um, how many women are criminalized because of their mm. postpartum and like, do you find out afterwards, and specifically African American women? I wish I could give you that number right now. There's um, currently four cases that the Postpartum Support International is looking at and trying to defend women who've been accused of infanticide or fetal side, mm -hmm. and um, they apparently had postpartum psychosis. Right. So, and postpartum psychosis or Postpartum Support International has a whole legal wing to help support. Um, mothers and families who have had uh, in, in infanticide. And so that is a resource, but I can't tell you how many people are currently being prosecuted well, at this time, or is there a disparity among uh, black women? So, but is there something that, um, is there like anybody checking into that or researching that or? I, I don't know. Do you know, Dr. Know. Barkin? What? You said you had money. Is anyone doing, um, the question was about if, if anyone's doing research or has access to data about percentages of um, women who are being persecuted um, with mental health and if there's a racial disparity. Yeah. It's like 2% of the, of the of the one, th uh, the one in 1,000. Was the question really just about psychosis or was it just more in general about other, you know? No, my question was about, do, are, is a diagnosis missed and women are punished or are, are jailed for the? Possibly. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, but uh, and then are, is there research going on to help, uh, help these women? That's I see your future PhD. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Man, I ain't got an associate's yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment. I'm um, Karen Starks. I'm a professor at the School of Social Work and University of Alabama School of Social Work. I'm a clinician and have been for over 40 years, and I hear some of the things that are being said. And I just want to say, the DSM-5 is there to help give you those guidelines. When you're looking at at what age these different um, attributes might show up in terms of their diagnosis and things like that. So I just want to kind of put that out there that, you know, for people to look at that when they're looking at what kind of symptoms people have. Or, you know, bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 are not the same. Even though there's one and two, they're two distinct disorders. Correct. So I just want to do that because that's what you all are trying to do in terms of how you work with them clinically. So I just don't, I'm starting to hear information and this is just my interpretation of saying that we're starting to cross over and put things together and you are trying to show some distinct things that are there. And I think we just need to be clear in terms of what you all are doing, which to me, I would say is on the right thing or not to be confusing to other people because there are criteria mm -hmm. yeah, out there, there. There is certainly yes. criteria out there. However, mm -hmm. The DSM-5 does not clearly um, represent all of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. right. Right. But for sure, it is a guidepost mm -hmm. for us to all be speaking the same language as it refers to criteria. Sir. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to comment. Uh, I think you sort of preempted me there. DSM-5 is pretty clear that uh, with postpartum mental illness, it can 
well, I should say perinatal events can precipitate a diagnosis across the spectrum of psychotic disorders in women who have had them as a result or in association with their pregnancy. And I, to answer, to deal with your question, I've had cases of my own where the pregnant woman was diagnosable and received four or five different diagnoses. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote my report, I said, check the SM5 because it says these symptoms can cover a broad range of symptomatologies of these diagnoses can cover a broad range. So don't be deceived. I think they were trying to decide bipolar or one or another. But the thing that was most important is the husband was able to manipulate the legal system and have the, the mother lose custody of the child. Oh. And I continue to argue that no, this is related to her pregnancy. These are things that are related to the postpartum period. Mm -hmm. She was in jail and she lost her custody of the child. So I think that needs to be, to your question, I don't, I don't know any epidemiological data on that but in terms of cases, mm -hmm. they do exist. Yeah. And it is punitive. It can be used in a punitive manner mm -hmm. mm -hmm. because it can mimic so many other Right, and if we look at the case right now in Massachusetts, I mean, she was in care. She was on a lot of different medications, and there's been a lot of conversation around just all of it. Is this criminal? Is this, is this psychosis? If it is, is that relevant here? Does that mean, you know, I mean, from a legal, I mean, you're right, this is so complicated. You know, Elizabeth and I are mental health clinicians. You know, we are not medical doctors. We are not uh, lawyers. We know that there are different nuances across all of these different facets. And so I appreciate all of the comments and the considerations because, you know, there are a lot of factors that, you know, we could talk about it clinically and then we know that there are just a lot of other variables that are out there. And, and, and just, you know, as it relates to being misdiagnosed and the legal system, we certainly know of cases across the country where someone is going in to get, care, um, to get support when they're having OCD um, symptoms, reporting that they're having intrusive thoughts, and child protection services come in and take the child away and they're being penalized for coming in for support and getting the wrong diagnosis of, the, of mm -hmm. postpartum psychosis. So there is still a lot of awareness to be raised, education to be spread, and it is complicated. That's the other piece of it mm -hmm. too, even with the DSM-5. Mm -hmm. um, one more. Um, so commenting on the legal, the rate of, um, of, um, of legal interventions uh, and penalization, it, it, over, we don't really know how much of what we see at this point is because of mental health conditions. And I will say to illustrate that in many states, uh, suicides are classified under uh, accidental deaths. Um, they are lumped in together with overdoses. Uh, and I think that there may be some accidental deaths or things that are classified as accidental deaths that actually are suicide, but are not identified as such. So there's probably a lot more happening than we know because we are, one, not able to identify it, and two, we we lump it in with other things, so it doesn't look quite as bad as it does, as it really is. Right, our metrics are not ex accurate. Yeah. yeah. Right, oh, and I just just to clarify the questions, I think those are good ones too. Just keeping in mind that we are not giving a training on diagnosing someone. Okay, <laughs> absolutely follow. DSM, follow your protocols. I just want to make that distinction. We are talking about screening. We are talking about directing to appropriate care. And I recognize that a lot of you all who may be more on the medical side of things, I can understand. I just want to, I think that just reminded me that we need to clarify that too. You know, nothing that we're saying in and of itself would preempt a diagnosis or specific treatment. It's more just to get everybody building thinking awareness. about it, building awareness and thinking about it. Mm -hmm. 
And one last thing. Because my list is really long. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I just, so two things I wanted to comment on. You asked about you know, wrongful legislation for people that have committed um, infanticide. But not everybody that has psychosis kills anyone. Most right. don't. Right. So you're talking about a tiny, tiny sample size. So you couldn't even make legitimate statistical conclusions from it. I mean, this, this, the awareness of postpartum psychosis really is like last 10 years. And I mean, broadly, more in the public. And what, what's the going rate? One in a thousand? One to One two. One to two in a thousand. Two. But the, I mean, I'm hearing but of that. from people in the field, it's sounding like more and more. And some of that might be we're just getting a lot better at recognizing it, or maybe there is, there is a mental health crisis overall in, in this country. So. It, it could be a combination, but just kind of keep your eye on the postpartum psychosis rates because I mean I think I heard of three in one month of, of, of people that were in my my social reach. So, so. Because of postpartum depression, mm -hmm. it's too many. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's too many. We agree. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I don't think it's just. I don't think it's just death. It could be abuse or neglect or taking a, taking their children away, like um, mm -hmm. Mr. Mm -hmm. Henry said. Right. Yeah. Yeah, which is really underlying why we're all here today. Yeah. We want to create awareness. We want to create advocacy pro processes and protocols so that. You know, we're not going to get it perfect every time, but that we're we're having less and less of those instances where people are being, you know, misproperly treated. And sometimes it probably can be where they, it's not the fact that they're psychotic or something like that. Sometimes it might just be situations that they just can't handle because it wasn't like that with the first child. Mm -hmm. the lady, they're not prepared. I noticed on the film it was the, the lady was saying, "Why my baby keep crying?" Mm -hmm. Well. I experienced that with my daughter. First child was fine, the second child just cried, cried, cried. I went over there one day, I heard a little muffle crying, and I was like, where's Clay? He in there. Where's in there? He in there. She was born in the club. She had took the whole back and told put it in the club, closed the door, because she said she'd rather do that than to hurt the child. She's not mm -hmm. going to hurt her baby, but she got tired mm -hmm. of hearing crying. She fed him, she cried him, mm -hmm. and ain't nothing wrong with him, but he keep crying. She put him in the club. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, okay. So now we're going to move into the public health, um, social impact. And um, this is a really interesting study. So there, they did a five year study looking at moms and um, the child over five years and they look at what is the cost of untreated perinatal mental health. So, segueing to what we were just talking about is when we have untreated um, mental health, we are going to see higher rates of um, coping skills that are not good for us. So, there may be more drinking, there may be more drug use. There are going to be higher rates of um, everything from, you know, preeclampsia to every um, to developmental delays, child abuse, more hospital visits, more uh, delays in. Um, oh yeah, here we go. So. So it's really looking at, I mean, the, as we would just go back one back, one. So I, I just think that that's really a, a tall number of $14.2 billion. So think about if we were proactively helping our nation and everyone that lives in our nation and, and spent $14.2 billion of treating our um, moms and our families, what that could do, because again, these they have all of these things have long-term effects. Um, so you know, birth outcomes. So we see that um, there's there's higher rates of um, 
reduced prenatal care, increased risk of termination, as I already stated, higher rates of preterm delivery, preeclampsia, higher rates of abdominal um, deliveries, as far as increased abuse and neglect, um, challenges with attachment and bonding. And then we also see that untreated mental health impairs um, and, and gives risks to the child development. So again, this is a public health issue that is not just impacting the mother or the birth giver, but the whole family system. Higher rates of cortisol levels um, for mothers during pregnancy. I mean, it's just really, really important because this is all preventable. So risk factors. So some of the things we've already kind of talked about today, but again, starting with the body, what is happening. So we always want to rule out any medical issues that may be impairing the mom, but we're looking at sleep deprivation. There's higher risks for families um, that have their baby in the NICU or multiples. We see um, a history of infertility, which I just saw the stat on that, which is one in six um, moms or families are struggling with infertility. So that's something significant. Um, if we know that this is a time that people go through a lot of transition, so they're moving because of um, having a baby, moving maybe to a different home, moving because of work, um, sometimes we don't have those level of social supports um, that are so important. Obviously, we have to look at their, their history and have they had previous trauma or abuse? Um, is there obstetric violence occurring during their birth? Um, complications with breastfeeding or birth? So all of these are really important um, risk factors. And another piece as regards to infant temperaments, which I think is interesting, is, you know, Sometimes there can be an initial mismatch. You know, maybe I'm more introverted and I need a lot of extra time to, and I get overstimulated or I have some sensory issues myself and having a baby on me all of the time or maybe I have a higher needs baby or a colicky baby. Um, and so all of those play a role in the risk factors. So now we're looking at other risk factors. Mothers um, of color have rates of postpartum depression soaring close to 38%. And again, why is that? It's a number of things, but we know it's because of weathering and long-term discrimination and racism, um, impaired trust in the um, medical community, the strong black woman syndrome. So Culturally, we don't always allow everyone to feel like they can ask for help. So this is really valuable to be looking at. But when I do ask for help first, I somebody who's calling me. Well, that's right. Mm -hmm. Right. So what does that mean to even ask for help? Is it safe to ask for self or ask for help or are there consequences of calling defects? Mm -hmm or even judgment from other people. So it's, it's really important to look at this. Um, who else is at risk? Teen parents or women who are dealing with poverty can experience twice as high as the average. So this is really important. And so in the room, who works with young parents? I see some people. And is this pretty consistent to what you all are seeing, that they have higher risk factors as well? Yes. Yes, I'm seeing nods. Yes. 
And, you know, and we also know for, for teen parents that there's even stronger judgment with them. Right. Mm -hmm. Fear of defects. Fear of defects is a real thing. And and I think it's, a I'm sorry, it's okay. I think it's a conversation that we have to have because in my community, it's, it's very real. It's a real thing. I know uh, the organization that I'm with is, is um, promoting um, uh, something new called Help with Care mm -hmm. with the schools. And I think it, it has the possibility to backfire because and it's, it's not off topic, it's kind of still on the same topic. It's just the fear that we have as black women reporting how we feel, mm -hmm. uh, what happened to this, why my baby got a knot on the head today, you know what I'm saying? So if you do have a care in the school system and uh, our public service officers or our EMTs report, we had an incident at this house, so you have to watch this child and make sure that they're okay. It can backfire for us because we we are, we are nervous about yeah. reporting stuff and how it's looked at and what happened and where we in our location even. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think the conversation has to be had had just a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable, but it's needed. I hear you, and you know, similar vein and a little different. Last week, um, I saw that in Texas there was a black family that had a home birth and their baby had jaundice, which we all know is very common. Sometimes you can sit in the window and that's enough for your baby to get and sometimes you need more of a medical intervention to be um, at the hospital. But this family's baby was taken away from them and I mean, there was this huge campaign that I think it was either Sister Song or Black Mamas were working with them because they didn't know where their baby was taken um, because the baby had jaundice and they were getting treatment for that. So, and you know, and they were a black family. It, it, it's, it's real. And so it's really important that we have these conversations and are talking about this fear because this fear is often a reality for folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I try to encourage everybody, especially in our community, if you know someone who has had a baby or someone who is expected, ask them if they're okay. Yeah. Be that support for them. Let them know that it's safe. Tell me what you're really feeling because I experienced postpartum. Mm -hmm. I thought I was losing my mind. My family thought they were going to have to put me somewhere. Mm -hmm. I was afraid. I never experienced nothing like that in my life. So when I see other women, or I hear other families going through that, it's rough. You, nothing could have been wrong with your pregnancy. You could have never experienced postpartum or anything throughout your whole life, no type of anxiety, but something mm -hmm. about giving birth, mm -hmm. uh, your body has changed, not only physically, but mentally, and you're not the same person anymore. That's right. But mm -hmm. she's, she's definitely right. It's, it's, you're scared to tell somebody you're having these thoughts, like, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about the lady um, that you're seeing about the knife on the counter. Mm -hmm. You know, if I go to my aunt or somebody, like, I'm, I don't know about this knife being on the counter, they're going to look at me like, why can't the knife be on the counter? That's right. You know? Right. So we do have to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I just wanted to add to that, too. I mean, it doesn't discriminate. You're absolutely correct in terms of who's at risk. We talk about increased risk factors. That's important for us professionals to know who's at an increased risk so that we can really firm up more of those supports and those, you know, getting eyes. But anyone anyone can develop any of these challenges um be it the first pregnancy or as she said you know second third or fourth pregnancy so you right. know everybody needs to be we'll get to this in a minute but everybody needs to be screened everybody needs to be supported um you know right. absolutely absolutely so did you know that 33 percent of people who will give birth report it to be a traumatic experience can you can you guys hear us back there can you hear us back there? Okay. Yeah. So this is significant. And depending on each state, um, this is a general st statistic. 
However, in different states, I had recently done a training up in Alaska and they had higher rates of birth trauma. So it's really important to recognize this because again, trauma is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. So you could have, for all intensive purposes, a healthy baby and a healthy experience from the outside but that is not necessarily what the birthing person experiences so we have to reserve our judgments and assumptions and to to know this one third of births are considered traumatic So what makes um, a birth traumatic? And there's, well, sure, yeah. So remembering that, why do we care about this, right? Because if someone feels like they had trauma in their birth experience, then that needs to be supported. You know, that has the potential to either bring on and or exacerbate symptoms that they're already having. And so, we can't just assume that if Elizabeth said they have a healthy baby, they have a quote natural normal birth, that they're not experiencing trauma. It's really about their experience, right? So we have to think about not only the experience that happened, but how did they feel in that? When we talk about feeling disempowered, if they're working with a provider who's not listening to their requests, if they're not being informed of what's happening, you know, thinking about having to move to a, an emergency um, surgery type experience, um, not being able to be given medication or getting medication that's not working, being told that they can't hold their baby right away and not understanding why. Um, you know, if they feel empowered and supported, even in what we might consider to be a really difficult situation, it's very possible if you see in this sort of right-hand column that they can still walk away with a pretty positive, empowered experience. Um, and yet, if they feel powerless and confused, the most likely what we're going to see is this sort of column over here, right? And again, when we talk about mental health, we're thinking about why do we care about trauma? You know, we want to be looking for something that might ultimately end up with post-traumatic stress disorder or just increased stress leading to depress depression and or anxiety or any other mental health condition. So. Thinking about if you happen to be in a position where you are able to be at the birth of a baby or be a supportive person at the birth of a baby, then anything that you might be able to do to help increase that empowerment, ask questions, see how she wants to be treated, he wants to be treated, they want to be treated, um, and just trying to open up that conversation. And, and one of the key pieces that we hear clinically over and over is, again, no matter what kind of birth that, the, that they are having is the experience of I am consenting or this is happening to me. So it is all about consent versus happening to me. And that is a piece that is so valuable and there's so many things that we can do to provide that level of support and consent for people. Does that make sense? Um, and are there any doulas in the room? No, is everyone familiar with what a doula is? Yeah, no? So a, a doula is um, a support person that can be, um, there can be a birth doula or a postpartum doula, there's even a death doula, and there's lots of different kinds of um, doulas, but a birth doula is someone that comes with you to your birth, and they provide education to the birthing person and their partner, and they give a high level of support and care that is consistent versus the doctors, nurses, midwives that are coming in during, with shifts. And what we know is that having a doula at your birth can decrease abdominal births by 
So decreasing C-sections by 40%, which is you know major surgery, beneficial to have when we need it, um, but that's very, very significant. And because, which we're gonna segue into maternal mortality, we know that having doulas present at births can also save lives. And there's a lot of documentation about that. It's really, really important um, to know about doulas. Um, so maternal mortality is on the rise. I found this to be very, very staggering. I don't know if you all saw this. This all came out in the last couple weeks in uh, New York Times had an article, um, but the CDC just put out a report. So maternal mortality in 2021, CDC reports approximately 1,205 women and birthing people died because of pregnancy or pregnancy-related complications. So look at the rates of 2018 versus now. So that's almost a double, double. In Georgia, it is safer to give birth in Uzbekistan than it is in Georgia, okay? So this is very, very significant to look at. Now certainly some of this is related to the pandemic, right? and um, that we've seen this huge spike, um, but it, it, and, and the tax um, medical system, but it, this is still a huge, huge problem that we need to address immediately. We're in a maternal mortality crisis. And then racial disparity. So as um, Dr. Redding said, Red, Reddick, said this morning, I mean, women of color, black women, um, it's the stats change depending on what you're looking at, 2.6 times up to three times um, the, um, compared to women or white women and um, non-Hispanic women. So it's really, and this, um, these numbers among black women and women of color continue to rise as well. So this is very, very um, significant. Hey, Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, so just being mindful of the schedule and time, um, we're a little behind, um, which is great. I think all the conversations have been wonderful. So we're just gonna take a second and regroup. Um, we have about 15 minutes left okay so i don't know if we want to move into some of the screening and just talk broadly about that yes. and then move into the because i think the resources are really important for everyone absolutely absolutely i do think it, this is also mm -hmm. valuable to note that women over 40 are seven times greater than women under 25 um, years old um, for maternal mortality um, and then this is here in georgia so 46.2 maternal deaths per thousand live births and a rate of 66 point deaths per 1,000 live births for African American women. So again, this is staggering, criminal, criminal. So let's move into screening quickly. Let's get it on it. Okay, so we know one thing that's often on everyone's minds, you know, well, what do I do? I've got, you know, my limited time working with someone. I've got a million different things that I want to cover. Um, we just want to really spend a little bit of time talking about options for trying to get people connected with appropriate resources. So just remembering that we can use formal screening tools or we could use informal screening tools. Often the recommendation would be to do a combination of both. So let's get into that a little bit. Um, and also, I think we've probably highlighted this a few different times. I think it's worth mentioning again. Everybody needs to be screened often. Does not matter how they, how they look, how they appear, what their history is. Of course, we want to be considerate of those increased risk factors. But generally, the recommendation is to screen everyone. Here listed is we've referenced Postpartum Support International, which if you're not familiar is a nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing support and advocacy and awareness of maternal or perinatal mental health. 
Elizabeth and I have both been active members of the Georgia chapter here locally, but there are chapters across the country and is also across the world. And I just wanted to spend a minute on that because I know we've referenced it and I just want to make sure that everyone's familiar when we, when we talk about PSI and we'll share their information later on the presentation. But you know, if you just look at this generally, right, and as I want to just highlight, regardless of what, where you are in your career, regardless of where you're at in your influence with wherever you work, just being aware if, you're, if you have a program for screening. And if there's not, ask the questions. Do we have a protocol for screening? Where can we improve that? Um, in pregnancy, we want to be seeing that at almost all of those kind of critical milestone appointments in addition to all the other screenings that you know they're going to be getting. And how we do it is also just as important as what we're doing. Throwing, and this is by no means a sign of you know judgment or disrespect, and none of you would do this, um, but throwing a screening at someone and saying fill this out in addition to a bunch of other papers and then not reviewing <coughs> it with them or explaining you know, in an ideal world, it would look like, you know, we're gonna be meeting and every time I'm gonna be asking you these questions. Every time we're gonna be going through the, at these intervals. Because that okay. also normalizes it It normalizes too. it. It's not just because I saw something in you that scared me and now I'm gonna give you this assessment. Right. Everybody gets this. You can get it every time. Right, whether you're dressed up or you've got, you know, you're in your PJs. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Um, Reddick talked about several different wonderful screening tools that are out there. We've highlighted two up here, which are free and accessible and are validated for this time frame. Both are available online. Um, it's the EPDS, if you're not familiar, as well as the PHQ-9. Um, remembering these are screening tools, not diagnostic tools, so this would be part of your overall clinical assessment. But at the very least, knowing that this can help to get you some objective data on who do we want to really kind of add additional supports and interventions and assessments with. Um, generally speaking, for both of those, the cutoff is a 10, is considered a positive screen. You know, there are limitations to these. You know, the EPDS is not gonna necessarily always pick up those anxiety symptoms, which we talked about earlier, are gonna be possibly more prevalent, um, but it's a, good, it's a good start. And they're validated on the phone, they're also validated for dads and partners. They're translated in many different languages. As we talked about, there's also the informal screening tools. Asking at every visit or every interaction with a pregnant or postpartum woman. You know, during the week, are you having more days than, bad more days. bad days than good days? Are you not feeling like yourself, right? Are you having thoughts that are scaring you, like we talked about, or just generally, are you having difficulty adjusting? As Dr. Reddick mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the grayer areas where we're, we're really getting into a lot of trouble. You know, someone who's presenting and maybe isn't really seriously experiencing the symptoms, which we want to treat them as well, but we're missing a lot of folks that are just, you know, functioning, but not doing okay. Because we normalize so much of, you're a new mom, of course you're this. You're a new dad, of course you're that. Of course you're tired, of course you're this. And then we often miss. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so the age old question. So now you're sitting with someone and you actually give them the screening tool or they answer the question in a way that you're like, ah, now what do I do? So some general framework that we offer um, is you know, thinking about that scale on the EPDS or the PHQ-9 or some of these other screening tools regardless if they're in that category where they're showing some concern, we want to give them information, provide psychoeducation, normalize it, let them know the importance of getting treatment early and often that this is treatable, that they can feel better, and that support is available. And they're not to blame. Right. Um, offer to help them get in touch with as many people as you can. Um, we recognize their limitations provide you know with what your role and you may not have the time to really sit down at the very least if you hand them a number and say here's a free hotline here's a here's a number to call here's a list of therapists here's a list of local supports just give somebody a call you know that's that's a good start right um, oh if you can just go back a second. and you know where we're getting into the more significant higher levels you know, certainly like we talked about before, if we're concerned with suicidality, if we're concerned with psychosis, then that would be a 
a case for using your emergency protocol and making sure that there's additional care which will in there which yeah, yeah we'll get into again we'll just kind of go through this but again really normalizing making them know that they're this is not a life sentence it doesn't have to be they can get better um, thinking about the language that we're using. Unfortunately, I think in an attempt to make everyone feel okay, we try to sometimes downplay. Oh, everybody's tired. That's normal, you're a new mom, welcome to the club. And I get the intention of that. Unfortunately, it's, we can't keep doing that, you know? Cause that's stopping them from, then they think, oh, I guess that I'm not, this is it. Um, so letting them know that this is a life-changing event Help is available, you know, again, see the common themes here. Um, we just wanted to just really note, and hopefully I'm, I'm guessing that the doctors will get into this a little bit more when we talk about medication management, when we talk about, um, you know, just meeting the moms where they're at. And when it comes to feeding your baby, what, what we say is, you know, mom is best. You know, and taking care of mom is taking care of baby. If, if she's able to and wants to breastfeed or chest feed or baby, feed her baby in that way, then we wanna try and support that. If they do not want to, cannot want to, it is impacting their mental, their mental health in a significant way, i.e. not getting enough sleep because they're feeding all hours of the night, they can't access support because of that, then we wanna consider that. So it can be both supportive and protective. Yes. So because of time, we're just going to note that um, it's important that we're looking at dads and partners. We know that with if a mom is suffering, that um, significantly increases dad and partners um, risk factors. But one right now, the conservative research is one in ten. Um, dads or partners are suffering from perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. PSI Georgia has a bunch of free downloadables and this is for new and expecting parents. It's over here at the table. We have it in both English and in Spanish and it's two sides. It's great to have to give to your clients as well as uh, brochures over here. So please take them all and you can also get um, you can download them and um, at your office. Yes, you can download them directly off the website. You can also contact PSI Georgia directly. The website's listed on there, and there should be a link to request um, a bulk, bulk copies of those. So very quickly, treatable um, options are support groups, um, medication, hospitalization, psychotherapy, alternative therapies, and social support. So social um, support groups, there are a ton with postpartum support international free virtual support groups. Mm -hmm. There's probably 20 different kinds um, for both moms and dads. Um, so that's really important. Um, We've kind of talked about the benefits of psychotherapy. We're gonna talk about medication here in a moment. Alternative therapies, the things that I wanna just highlight right here that are really um, impactful for mild postpartum depression is light box therapy. And that is really uh, $30. You can get a light box and that can be very beneficial for people, especially if they wanna try that before medication. Um, as well as acupuncture can be very good for folks. Uh, barriers to treatment. We know that there's a lot of those um, because people aren't screening, fears around child protection services like we talked about, stigma, um, isolation, in um, domestic violent relationships cultural biases and mythology around um, getting support. So let's just get into the resources really quickly before we um, have to go. I wanna get it. So here are free resources. So PSI has a helpline. That is not the, um, we'll talk about the hotline, but the helpline can be very, very good because there's trained professionals 
We have a PSI directory here in Georgia in every state that has a directory of specialized trained clinicians. Mm -hmm. We also have PSI coordinators that will help triage resources for your area and then there's educational materials for PSI Georgia and with um, PSI in general. This is what the directory looks like. And here is our information if you have more questions. Sorry we had to rush through <laughs> the last part of it, but we really appreciate everyone here um, today. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.